Hello and welcome back to Handheld Computing. Today we're having a look at one of Casio's digital diaries from some time in the 1990s. It's very difficult to know when as there's very little information about its manufacture or sale on the internet. I believe this is probably due to its short production life given how many digital diaries Casio actually made, which number into the hundreds. Special thanks to Sudashan Perajuli for suggesting this video, and a thanks to my fiancé for buying this digital diary for me for Christmas. As we move from the 80s into the 90s, digital devices became much more common, and many of them became significantly cheaper than their full-blown counterparts, such as the Scions or the sharp handheld computers of the time. There was a huge number of electronic dictionaries, thesaurus, translators, and of course personal digital assistants, of which this belongs in that category. The way it works is reminiscent of data bank watches, or indeed data calcs, also produced by Casio, but of course with larger memories and extra functions. The vast majority of these personal digital assistants would include calendars, memos, telephone or address books, some included to-do lists and could even connect and sync to your PC. Later models included infrared to beam information or messages backwards and forwards, and there were even models specifically aimed at children. They all tended to be of a similar style, clamshell with rubberized keyboards and an LCD display. The computer itself was often just a single chip or a couple of chips on a board, making these things cheap to manufacture, and they would often retail between 20 and 30 pounds, brand new. So let's take a look at this one. So of course we've got 32k of memory, that's obviously a big selling point, conversion, upper and lower case characters, and then in another language, the same thing. On the side there's a sticker saying this was $11.99, not sure if that would have been new or discounted, nothing much on the side, and on the back it tells us a little bit more about it. So we've got conversion, to-do list, telephone directory, home time on world time, a meeting schedule, calculator, memo pad, alarm, and a secret function. Nothing on the bottom, let's open it up and have a look. So that's everything from in there. So we've got to read this first, warning us that we've got to do a reset before we do anything else in various languages. We've got a guarantee certificate, though I think this is probably out of date. This points out that if you remove both batteries at once, you'll lose all your data. And finally, the instruction manual. So here it is, the very catchily named Casio Digital Diary SF3300A with 32 kilobits. If we have a quick look over the device, you'll see there's just a hinge on the back, no ports on either side or the front, and the battery box underneath. So we'll pop some batteries in. There's a locking mechanism so that it's difficult to remove both at once, and that's because you lose all your data if you do. And I'm just going to press and hold the reset button. And we'll close it up. Opening the lid, we get a quick guide at the top. We've got a number pad on this particular version. Quick buttons to the various options. An on off button. QWERTY keyboard with symbols in red. So to complete the reset, we need to press set. As you can see, when you first turn it on, we get the information on how much is used and how much memory is free. It then jumps to the last category that was used. So we're currently in the telephone category. Pressing this button once takes you to memo, twice takes you to the to-do list. This one is schedule. So here we get time, world time, and alarm. The secret function followed by any of these puts you into a secret category. And calculator and then conversion. To adjust the display contrast, you need to go to calculator and use the up and down arrows. So let's start by putting in a contact. To enter a new entry, just start typing. We're currently in caps as denoted by this little C. To change that, you need to press shift and then caps. As you can see, when you reach the end of the line, it moves on to a new page. Hitting set, we're allowed to add an email. Pressing shift once takes you to symbols and then reverts back to letters. After email, we get telephone number, fax, we'll leave that, pager number, shows how old this is, cell phone, 
and then we get the complete listing. If you have quite a few addresses in there, you're going to want to be able to search. So that's easily done. All you do, you press the button for what you want to search. So in this case, telephone memos, and you pop in the first couple of letters and hit an arrow key. This will bring up your search matches. There's some serious limitations to this. So first and foremost, it's case sensitive. Secondly, even if the cases are correct, you can't search by anything other than the first name. So you must be very careful when inputting information into this, otherwise you're not going to be able to retrieve it afterwards easily. The other option is simply to use the arrow keys to scroll through to who you want to look at. In the case of this one, we've got more than just the name, phone number and mobile number. You'll see a little arrow at the bottom and pressing this button brings up the email address. As you can see, it doesn't automatically scroll. Instead, you get the first 12 characters and counterintuitively using the up down button here, you can see the remainder of it. Why they didn't implement the left and right feature, I don't know. There's one major thing missing from this contacts list, and that is an address. Let's take a look at the memo pad. So pressing this button once brings up memo. There's nothing in there at the moment, so we'll just write one. So now we've got a couple of memos in there. We can have a look at how it works. So we've got the same search function as we have with the telephone application. Obviously, this isn't going to be very useful in the memo pad because you'll have to remember what the first word was and whether you capitalized the first letter or not. So instead, we're going to use the up down arrow keys. So here we are on a longer memo. The limit is 48 characters. It doesn't automatically scroll as it would on a Scion 2, for example. So instead, we have to use the counterintuitive up down arrow. When you make an entry, once you, once you reach 12 characters, it simply starts a new line. So this makes the entry feel a little bit disjointed as you end up with lots of half words. Still, as a quick way of just jotting something down, I could see this being quite handy and it doesn't take much effort to scroll through and see what it was you wanted. It's just unfortunate there isn't an auto scroll function. So to get to the to-do list, you press memo once and then again, and we reach a to-do, do what? So you can add something in, press set and it's in. You'll notice there's several things missing. So there's no way to set an alarm. You can't set a priority. There's no category function. So it's a very limited application, essentially just creating a list. So the other thing worth noting is that when you edit or go back to rewrite anything, it actually writes directly over the top, not moving the text along and leaves the remainder as was. So it's probably just as well that there's a 48 character limit as you wouldn't want to write more than that and then have to rewrite the whole thing simply to change one word. Creating an appointment is easy. Simply press schedule and start typing. We have the same limits in terms of characters and editing as all the other applications. Hitting set brings up this menu so you can change the year, the month, and of course the time. Pressing P takes it to PM. Once that's done, press set. Again, you can search the schedule function. You can use the arrow keys to scroll through. If you want to set an alarm, that's actually done in alarm and we'll come to that in a moment. So let's take a look at the time. So to set the time, all you need to do is press edit. You can now set the year, the month, the day, and the time. Using the up down arrows, you can choose your home city. So I'll set mine to London. Pressing set saves those changes. Pressing time again brings up world time. Obviously London is the same, but scrolling through, we can see what time it is in other parts of the world. Pressing a third time brings up the alarm function. You can set an individual alarm by simply selecting edit, choosing the time, AM or PM and pressing set. From here, pressing the little sound icon on the space button takes us into this option. So we can choose to have the alarm on and off. This is the time signal status. I'm really not sure what that actually does. This is whether or not you want the keys to make a sound or not when you press them. I'm gonna leave it as a no. This is whether or not you want items in your schedule to beep when they're due. Once you're happy with those, Press set and we return to the main menu. 
Next up is the secret mode. And in some ways, this is probably the most useful of all the modes, given how many passwords and things we need to keep. So all we need to do is press secret. We need to enter a password because we haven't got one yet. So we'll have 007. And now we're in secret mode as dictated by this little key. If we change mode, we can put in a memo and save it as usual. All the functions are exactly the same as normal. Pressing the secret key takes you back to normal. So that memo isn't here. Pressing secret again demands the pass key. And if you get it wrong, it just doesn't do anything. So this could be useful for storing usernames and passwords in a secure manner. The batteries in this are likely to last well over 12 months. And the recommendation in the instructions is that you change them once every three years, even if you've not used them. So next, let's look at the calculator. No, let's not bother. It's a calculator. We all know how to use them. Pressing it a second time, though, brings us to the conversion function. So this is set up with dollars and pounds equal to one. So it's a one to one ratio. It's very easy to change it. All you need to do is press edit. You can then add any three letter description. So you might have francs, for example, if you were French and want to convert them to pounds. Once you put your new letters in, just press set and then say what the rate is. So we would have one franc to about 10p. So our rate's gonna be 0.1. Pressing set again, sets the rate to 0.1, and now we can convert either way. If we put in a bigger number and then do the same, we now get 200 francs equals 20 pounds. And if we want to go the other way, 20 pounds equals 200 francs. So very straightforward. I could see this being genuinely useful when you're on your travels and the numbers and the currencies that you set up remain in memory in between. So the SF3300A is quite a basic model. It didn't include a backlight or any connectivity features. As I mentioned earlier, Casio did create well over 150 different devices. There is a website dedicated to it, link in the description below. Although the website itself does look a little incomplete and as yet I haven't tried joining the fan club. So overall, this is a perfectly functional device. I think it misses an awful lot of the features that we see on more expensive devices of the time period, such as the Palm, Scion or early CE models. That said, one of these would retail for perhaps 20 or 30 pounds, whereas a Palm at the time would have been nearer 400. So in that respect, I guess you get what you pay for. But as a device to buy now, it is quite limited. There's no address function. The 48 character limit really restricts what you can use it for. And the lack of scrolling makes all your memos a little illegible. They do have great battery life. And to be sure, the secret function is going to be pretty difficult to crack since it's completely offline. But those memos are a bit too short to keep your crypto key on. Today, you could easily pick up one of these for around five pounds. But the real question is, should you? In my opinion, if you're looking for a personal organizer, I would spend a little bit more and go for an original Palm Pilot or an M500, a CE device, or go super retro and get a Scion 2. Most of these would come in under 20 pounds and offer a lot more functionality. That said, you might think differently. Perhaps you've been using a digital diary for the last 20 years, in which case, pop a comment below. And while we're at it, pop a comment below with your best handheld bargains. Mine would be this, Palm Pilot Original. It came with no cradle, but it only cost $4.95 and it works perfectly, even the backlight. So let me know what kind of bargains you've managed to snag. And of course, if you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We reached a thousand subs at the end of April, which I'm very pleased about. So a big thanks to everyone who's subscribed already. My name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.